This is Wells Tech, a show that explores the intersection of technology and ministry. Wells Tech is a part of the Streams Media Network, sponsored by Wells, the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. Your show hosts are Martin Spriggs and Sally Draper. Join the conversation at wellstech.wells.net. Wells Tech is back and better than ever in 2015. This is episode 374 for January 6th in the new year. And uh, this is Martin Spriggs and a show about technology and ministry. And joining me as usual in 2015 now, Sally Draper. Hi, Sally. How was your new year? Oh, it was awesome, Martin. I, I told a few people I hadn't given it any thought whatsoever. But when I opened my eyes on... Uh, whatever day that was, Tuesday morning, Thursday morning, Thursday, whatever it yeah. was, and it was 2015, I thought immediately, wow, I'm going to turn 50 this year. <laughs> <laughs> like, out of the blue, welcome to the new year. <laughs> God has a way of just reminding us of our own humanity, and that's okay. Exactly. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with 50. It's not a lot different than 49. And yeah, at least you're, at least AARP, you're not of the mind that you have to, that you hide the age. So it's, no. You're I'm right out there for everybody now. Proud of it. Yep. Excited for it, actually. You're a survivor. Yeah. Excited for this show today, Martin. It's a really fun show for us put, to put together because we get to kind of reflect on the previous year and all the technology and ministry things that have happened in 2014. Wells Tech tradition these days, and that's uh, the ability to take a look back, and I'm assuming one of our upcoming shows will take a look forward. But it's fun to kind of look over 52 shows. We've covered a lot of territory. We did a lot of different things, and uh, we have our highlights and lowlights. We'll focus on the highlights, as is also our tradition this year. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I don't know about you, Martin. I kind of reflected personally a little as well, and I think if I were to um, categorize 2014 for technology, for me, the one thing that, that rises to the top is that I did a lot of Google stuff and a lot of Google site work, and um, I guess I wouldn't have predicted that Google Sites would become uh, a go-to um, web platform for me, but it is free and easy to do once you learn the, tr the tricks around um, how to make it work for you. And I, We've put a lot of effort into our Wells Tech Wiki. Um, we built that on, a, on the Google Sites platform. Um, I redid all the final web documentation, put that on a Google Sites platform. So 2014 will go down in history as a Google Sites year for me. Well, with your laundry list there, I feel totally inadequate. It didn't seem like I did anything. Maybe just a mobile app or so? <laughs> we released a mobile app over the holidays, which was the good news. Uh, that was yeah. a labor of love, as, as usual. And hopefully that will be a, a ongoing in 2015. I think mobile in general is a theme we'll see in 2015, but it was also a theme of 2014. I think in most of our shows we talked about mobile quite a lot and its application for ministry, which is really the point of the show. So hopefully we'll continue to kind of zero in on those things that are helpful to our, our listeners and viewers. And um, you know, in our prayer before the show, I pray that, boy, the opportunities that God is going to present in 2015 for everybody uh, you know, will be taken advantage of because uh, God, is, God is providing those tools for us, and it's our job to figure out which ones to use, when to use them to his glory. Super exciting stuff. So, um, like last year, Martin, we kind of organized this show around different um, things that happen throughout the year, and our maybe we should start our discussion yeah. with events that took place in 2014. All right, go right ahead. <laughs> my turn again, huh? All right, um, and the one that popped out in my mind was the fact that we were together for the um, Kettle Moraine Lutheran Tech and Teach event. It happened in early June, and we actually, um, I think we both presented there as well as um, doing the podcast live from that location. We kind of corralled a few of our Wells Tech friends, Kurt Gosdick and Rachel Pearson, to sit in with us on that show and... Um, talked about all kinds of cool stuff. It was a, a good day and a great chance to be around maybe 200 or so educators from the Kettle Moraine yep. uh, High School Association. Yeah, and that reminds me that James Karlowski at the time was at Kettle. He was kind of the, the brain be, brains behind that uh, 
effort, and which was really a, a good thing to see. It was you know right after school was over, and they decided we're going to spend some time talking about technology in the classroom. And they had a lot of good people come in and give presentations. And now James is up at New Ulm, kind of doing the same thing that that uh, technology focus. And it's interesting how God moves His people around and. Um, to, to the good of the kingdom there as well. So it was, uh, yeah, I enjoyed the I enjoyed the time as well. That was one of my favorite moments, just kind of the interview process of, you know, having other people around and uh, getting other people involved with the show, uh, friends of the show. So, yeah, special shout out to James. He is my coworker at MLC now, and um, we're enjoying working with Dr. Jim Grunwall as well on uh, different technology efforts. I will give a plug to James because he's got a. Uh, tech and teaching um, activity going on right now with the faculty and I believe they're having a series of Google Hangouts tomorrow to just get them oriented to the Google Hangout environment. So he's got a lot of cool stuff going on at MLC and he just recently finished the Google um, certification process with a series of exams required for that. So yeah. James is, is a blessing for sure at MLC. That's kind of an interesting um, threshold that a lot of organizations are either reached in 2014 or will reach in 2015 where they're, that obstacle of the technology is standing between them and ministry like Google Hangouts, you know, that it's hard, that, you know, you got to get the account, you got to know how these video conferencing things work, you need to understand your your webcam and all this other stuff. I think as as the years go by, that becomes less and less a barrier. That technology becomes more of your friend and enabler versus that thing that, you know, is really kind of blocking really what you want to do. So ministry, I think, will really benefit uh, by God's grace through just our comfort level. Maybe we could call it with technology. That's what we try and do here on the show, too. Uh, there will be, always be new things to learn, but I think as you get some of those heavy hitters out of the way like video conferencing and social networking and those kinds of things, uh, ministry is the winner. I totally agree, Martin. I guess the word I think of is ubiquitous and the fact that um, we use our, our, our word processing software, for instance, without thinking nowadays. Right and making it do all the different formatting and layouts and things that we want it to do. It's part of who we are and, and that's pretty universal and expected. And I think as things like video conferencing or just creating websites or whatever it may be becomes more and more of a, a given for everyone, the world's going to look a lot different. That's probably a good segue to an exciting event coming up in 2015, which we began work for in 2014, and that's the Wells Tech Conference, July 9th to 11th. Uh, we're just kind of nailing down all the speakers and workshops, and all of those topics that we're seeing are really uh, could be very helpful in ministry, uh, whether that be in the classroom or in the church or in outreach fields or wherever just getting a lot of smart people together to to give those presentations and there's not a one of them that I think we've got on the docket now of however many we've got 50 or 100 that are uh, that I wouldn't mind sitting through and, and I'm sure I would learn something from Definitely. So if you guys are just um, learning about the Wells Tech Conference you need to head over to wells.net slash Wells Tech Conf C O N F and um, what you're going to find there is information about the dates, July 9th through 11th, the location, Country Springs Hotel and Conference Center in Waukesha, Wisconsin. Um, pricing will be $199 for conference plus your, your travel and lodging um, will add on to that somewhat. Um, but there's a form you can fill out and give us your name and email address and we'll let you know as soon as the registration opens up. That'll be um, early February, February 1st. Um, so just about a month away when you can actually start uh, registering for the conference. So really get on your calendar and begin the conversations with uh, the leadership at your church or school to, to help you out with the cost of sending you there. It'll be worth every penny and it, it, it really is a deal for everything that you're getting with the meals and uh, the presentations and the opportunity for networking. Just a uh, really good uh, three days if you go to the pre-conference workshops which were which are also a bargain if you take a look at the site. So. Good deal. Should we move along to what's the next segment here, Sally? Well, um, maybe we tech should talk about ministry. some of our... I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. You want to do tech and ministry next, I that segment? Like that. Except I don't see it on my mind map. <laughs> oh, I do. New and notable tech, tech and wiki ministry. Wiki migration, that was the big one there. 
<laughs> Absolutely, Martin. You you uh, are, hit the nail on the head with that, and I actually have it up on my screen. I'll do a quick screen share for those watching the video. Um, you can get to our Wells Tech Wiki now at wellstechwiki.gapps.wells.net because it is on a uh, Google site. We include that gapps in there for our domain name. Um, and we reorganized the wiki. It was kind of the wild, wild west. There was a whole lot of... Um, of great information in our in our prior wiki, but it wasn't very organized at all. So now you can jump to Bible, church, communication, infrastructure, office, planning and policy, or school. Those are our main categories. And as you drill down into any of those, then you can see sublevel pages um, and get to all kinds of great information about technology and ministry. So. Um, do check it out. The great news is um, you can easily request an account. There's a link at the top to request an account. We'll get you added to the um, to the editing privileges on the wiki, and then you can go in and add your um, information wherever it may fit and help us keep it all up to date and current. Um, after all the work we put in over our summer series, Martin, we definitely want um, the wiki to to represent things well. Grow and grow. Yeah, I was uh, updating one page today and referencing another. Somebody was asking about copyright information today, so I pointed them to our you know, very lengthy copyright page there on the Wells Tech Wiki. And uh, also somebody gave me um, a link to their live service, live streaming service, and we have a page on the Wiki that tries to uh, capture all of the congregations who have live who are streaming their services live and I'm sure that's woefully incomplete so if you want to take a look at uh, the wiki and that page in particular and if your church is live streaming let's get it up there on the page for everybody to, to check out for sure so you, you kind of kill two birds with one stone if you go ahead and ask for an account and make those changes you're going to be learning how to use a Google site in the process and it's really um, easy to do and there's even a link on the, on the page that shows you how to, to edit things and what icons you should be looking for and that kind of thing. So Good. I'm sure there's people yeah. out there with New Year's resolutions that have to do with you know getting a little Google smarts and them they're there's the Google into the classroom. <laughs> Sally, next segment, uh, and this is kind of a fun one, uh, favorite episodes of 2014. Uh, we had 52 to choose from, and uh, there were a lot of highlights, I think, over this past year, maybe even more than any other year, so it's kind of hard to choose. What was one of your favorite episodes of 2014? Well, one that jumped out at me was one from um, April, Martin. We, we make it our policy to do education topics. Um, Typically, we, we have an education-focused um, co-host, either Gail Potratz or Jason Schmidt, um, join us on the last show of each month throughout the school year. This is one that um, I believe uh, Gail joined us on. And um, on this show, we specifically talked about school technology planning. Um, it kind of stemmed from a... a an email that Jenny Adelmeyer from St. John's in Lemire, Wisconsin sent to a group of friends that she knew to be techie. And she just kind of posed the question, you know, what's the best direction for us to go in terms of technology? This is where we're at. And I'm supposed to do technology. I'm not quite sure where to go. And from that, she just got a wealth, <laughs> like a tidal wave of great information from this group of techies. Um, and it included a lot of different people from around the Senate. Gail and, and Jason were both in the um, email conversation, as was Justin um, Leppert and others. And so what we did was we kind of compiled all that great information, and we actually put together a slideshow um, out on SlideShare um, that that had the information in it and posted it out there and you know this one jumps to mind in particular because the slideshow actually has had almost 900 views, 899 views um, since that April release and I thought that was really important and pointed to the fact <laughs> that there's a lot of people in Jenny's same shoes so um, a lot of people are at this somewhat of a crossroads with education and, and technology and wondering where to invest their dollars, how best to um, enhance education, not make technology the star, that's not what it's about, but have the tools in place to give the students the opportunities to use technology when appropriate in the classroom. And so um, not just with our, 
our normal Wells Tech audience, but expanding beyond that, um, this is obviously a big issue. So um, that was one of my favorites for sure. What about you, Martin? What shows stood out to you? Uh, the big one for me um, was one we did back uh, just uh, in the fall, September, uh, called The State of Social Media. One of the neat things about this show, this Wells Tech show, even though we have Wells in the name, is sometimes we get, uh, we certainly have viewers that aren't uh, Wells members, but sometimes we get people to interview that aren't Wells members either, and that was the case in this show where we had Warren Hunter who was a uh, social media consultant or a church technology consultant and it's always kind of nice to get fresh perspective not that I don't uh, enjoy our, our Wells based guests uh, because they bring a lot to the table as well but it's sometimes good to get a little fresh perspective an outside perspective and that's what Lauren brought she, she had some great resources and that's going to be uh, one of my favorite picks too one of the things that uh, she had something to do with but uh, uh, just kind of the, the general conversation, a very important conversation around social media and where that uh, where that's headed and uh, how churches and schools might be making better use of it. Uh, that kind of stood out for me as uh, one of the, the better shows of the year. Very good. And I think we both would agree that our book series are always of interest to us. I you know I get an added benefit by. Um, having the opportunity to read a book for work and and learn and discuss along with you Martin and those um, who are following it as well and in the fall of 2013 we kicked off a book series called The Shallows and um, that turned out to be a really great read it was um, subtitled What the Internet is Doing to Our Brain and um, it was interesting to kind of explore that topic and discuss um, the effect that this new way of thinking is having on um, outreach as well not just um, you know from an education perspective obviously we want to be able to teach our children who are learning with different styles now and that kind of thing but also from the outreach perspective and um, what kind of media maybe will appeal to those we're trying to reach and that kind of thing yeah, we had some interesting conversations throughout that book where we uh, agreed and we also agreed to disagree on a, on a number of topics. And uh, we got to talking about paperless versus, you know, kind of that analog world. And and that's kind of fun, too. And uh, we had a whole show on paperless as well. That was one of my favorite episodes. So, And actually, that's one of my New Year's resolutions is to, to kind of go more paperless. But uh, And that's okay. And it's important to understand the ramifications of all it. And that's what that book was really good at. It, it kind of did a really deep dive into um, what that means and what the screens are doing and what they could potentially do. And uh, it makes you take a step back and kind of consider what it is that's going on in your world. So um, if you haven't read it, um, pick up a copy, uh, and uh, whether it be a paper copy or a digital copy, and uh, and read through it. It's it's a very interesting read. Definitely. And the book we're doing now, I think, What's Best Next, is also um, going to rank for me as one of my favorites. Yeah, it's that changed, we've changed well. the way I do things already. I haven't even yeah. finished the book yet. So. Yep, I'm doing things a little different myself as well. Um, Martin, just talking about paper versus paperless, it, it brings back all those wonderful debates we've had. And <laughs> I also uh, remember kind of a dividing line that happened on one of our episodes, and I can't remember when, when we had a conversation about whether you wear a watch or not. And I found out that, that the fact that I wear a watch and still rely on this um, this connected um, media, not on my cell phone screen or whatever it may be to tell time, made me kind of a digital dinosaur. So that's kind of been my dividing line now. Anytime I do a presentation or whatever, I always survey the audience to yeah. see how many people are wearing watches, and, and it tells me something about my audience. So. Yeah. Well, I am wearing a watch right now. Woot! So. I'm actually not, <laughs> but I'm not going to tell you that. <laughs> But this is a nice uh, world watch, so it actually pulls the time. It's got some technology built in, so, it, so it pulls the time from the atomic clock where Denver, where Boulder, I guess it's in. Uh, so And it's solar, so oh, very I like cool. the tech part of it. But I'll be interested to see kind of the advancement of watches uh, through, I think 2015 will be the year yeah. of the watch. Apple, the Apple Watch will come out, and I'm sure some of the other, we're hearing from CES, some of the other watches coming out from Samsung and Sony that uh, 
Uh, I'm mostly interested in those that, uh, not so much that kind of are an extension of the phone, but do a lot of the health stuff. So they'll you know, do constant heart rate monitoring and steps and that kind of stuff. So yeah. mostly interested in from that perspective. And they do tell the time. So oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, pull your phone out of your pocket or purse to, to see what time it is. Um, should we move into the ever popular picks of the year segment? Uh, Sally, you want to lead off with maybe? Well, I pick three. Actually, I cheated. I got four in here, but uh, <laughs> and I you have actually five. have four as well. So. Well, kind of, yeah. <laughs> okay, or maybe five. Maybe uh, five. What were your favorites of the year? Your favorite picks? Um, I'll start with a pick that um, is kind of. Simple. It's it's Google Forms, and the fact that um, Google Forms is continually updating and adding new features just makes it something that stands out to me. Uh, it's super easy to to develop an online form to embed it on your website or just link to it. And this year, Google especially added the ability to get real particular about your formatting of your form, so you can um, use a lot more of their pre-formatted formats or you can select any of them and they have the ability to customize and then when you customize you can get really granular with the way things look on the form. Um, so lots more options so maybe I like a particular layout but I'm not that into the imagery that they've chosen for it so I can choose some different imagery or whatever and um, I just think adding that versatility with the themes packaged with all of the capabilities of the forms, all the different question types. Um, again, they're constantly updating. So if you if you choose different question types, now you can choose for them to be shuffled or um, shuffling even the order of the questions on the whole form. Um, just lots and lots of versatility here. Looks like a pretty simple tool on the outside, um, just with a quick look at it, but it doesn't play out that way. It plays out as super versatile and very powerful and um, just a really great tool. I love teaching people how to use it and especially educators just seem to get really excited when they know that they can use forms in their classroom for, for testing and feedback on all different things. So Lots of use cases for it both in the classroom but also at the congregation level. Uh, lots of reasons to want to interact with uh, the people that you communicate with and get, uh, get that inbound feedback or inbound information that's necessary to to uh, kind of cement the the, uh, the relationships whether it be volunteers who are signing up for something or time and talent surveys or BBS registration or whatever it is so lots of it's like we uh, talked about earlier it's like a tool in your tool belt that's just going to become ubiquitous that you're going to be able to to make use of with with ease and, yep. and that's exciting one thing I should ask you, Sally, talking about mobile, are Google Forms mobile friendly? I don't know the Hold answer. On a mobile I'm device? thinking they are, but I don't know. I'll okay. have to test that out. Uh, I, I stumped her already in 2015. Yeah, it didn't take long, did it? I bet it is. Uh, I bet they've thought about that, but uh, certainly important. Because more, uh, I think about it because more and more people are interacting with their with websites and those kinds of things, uh, not on computers anymore, but on iPads or. Kindle Fires or you know, iPhones, whatever. So. Yeah, definitely. Speaking of iPhones, that is my first and top pick of 2014, the iPhone 6. Um, I, I, I'm kind of leaning toward this being the best phone I've ever used. Um, so from the uh, size and weight to the quality to the battery life, which is awesome. Um, to the even the screen size just seems to be just the right size for me um, and uh, Apple has just done a nice job with this phone and uh, I have no desire to to uh, to use another one as my, my daily phone although I've got you know we've all have options uh, this just seems like a, a great tool for all kinds of things and then you throw in the the App Store and all the things that Apple brings, and another whole ecosystem that uh, I hadn't even thought about is the uh, all of the accessories and the things that uh, connect with the iPhone. And we've heard about things like automatic that'll you know interact with your car, um, you know heart rate monitors, and um, 
you know, blood pressure checkers and home automation thing, you know, turning lights on, opening garage doors, that kind of stuff is uh, just a whole system around uh, the iPhone or the the iOS system. I guess the one negative, if there is, and the, the camera's great, uh, the one negative is probably not having anything to do with the hardware, but the iOS 8 I still think is kind of buggy. Uh, I get a few crashes once in a while in different apps. Um, keyboard gets a little wonky. I had that problem today when I was trying to type in OneNote on the iPad where the I only had half a keyboard to work with and I couldn't close it, open it, I had to close the whole app down and, and restart it. So I'm sure Apple's working on that, but this is one of the buggier operating systems uh, that they, they've ever released. But uh, that aside, I think this is a, a great uh, a great tool both for communication but also uh, as a ministry tool. Yeah, I can't argue with that. I don't have a 6, I have a 5S, but yeah. um, it's definitely my go-to device and um, always with me, so my camera of choice and yeah. and yeah. my search tool of choice. We did a lot of tethering off of it when we... Yep, that too, yeah. Um, just Good lots device. of versatility there. Okay. You got another pick for us? I do. This one's kind of a tie. Um, I actually favorited two... Um, See if I can share my screen because I can't talk and share at the same time. Two different um, online design tools, kind of publishing type tools, where you can create things like um, uh, imagery for um, Pinterest or whatever your your um, area may be. The first one that I like is Canva at Canva.com, and I did just different things. I'm showing on the screen an example of a an image I found. Um, at Pixabay, which is a free image site, brought it in here and added some um, Bible verse to it. So just a really easy way to share a pretty picture on your Facebook page or whatever it may be. And um, they just have a, a large variety to choose from, a lot of different layouts and things that you can apply easily, but then you can also bring in your own imagery and they have a lot that's available at a fee as well. So you can use some of their imagery by for paying like a dollar an image or whatever it may be, but you can also just use their layouts, delete their imagery, and add your own free imagery that you've obtained. And it's pretty straightforward to work with. You can all add all kinds of text, um, different kind of background textures and things if you want to go that way, or you can get to your uploads. So pretty straightforward and fun to work with and, and an easy layout. Awesome. Um, I also favorited PictoChart at pictochart.com, which is more of an um, infographic kind of building tool. And I have on the screen an example I, want, I built to promote some technology training at MLC, just to show different types of training that were going to be available throughout the school year um, for our faculty and staff. And so again, I started with a pre-done layout and just edited to make it fit our needs and our terminologies and things like that. So if you're looking to build some infographics or if you're a teacher and you want to give your your students an opportunity to build infographics, I think PictoChart is definitely a good way to go. And lots and lots of really creative um, layouts that you can take advantage of there. So two different uh, web-based tools for free for uh, creating graphics. Yeah, the, the Canva, the first one you mentioned, I think is a great tool for those uh, congregations that uh, maybe want to amp up the the game a little bit when they're promoting, let's say, a sermon series or a particular Sunday. Get that out on the website, keeping the website fresh with uh, good imagery that represents uh, a theme for the Sunday, whatever. Uh, a lot of people think, well, I don't have any artistic talent. Um, it's going to be a real challenge for me. I'm, I don't know how to do Photoshop. I'm not a graphic designer. But tools like that really put it within the reach of, of almost anybody, the uh, the ability to, uh, to grab an image and uh, a Bible verse that is relevant to the topic of the day and uh, come up with something pretty professional. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm not sure about PictoChart, but Canva does have an iPad app. I've used it on my iPad as well, and it's very similar to this web experience and mm -hmm. easy to do on the iPad as well. So cool. definitely. Uh, my, uh, let me do a quick screen share. Uh, my pick, I also have a co-pick, by the way. If you can do it, I can do it. Because <laughs> um, they're, they're not related, but they're on the same platform. And... Uh, 
one of them is uh, day one, and this was a recent pick of mine. Um, it's a journaling app that uh, will work on um, all the <laughs> iOS platforms. There is no Android. I don't think there's an Android version. I, let me take that back. Maybe they do have one, but I'm thinking, I'm thinking not. Um, so on iOS, uh, so iPad, iPhone, uh, uh, Mac laptops and such, uh, you know, beautifully done uh, and very straightforward journaling app where you, you click a plus button and you start typing. You can add images, you can add tags so that you can retrieve previous posts. There are reminders, there's a whole timeline, the ability to uh, share as well so you can uh, write up a post and share it via Facebook or Twitter so it can act as a kind of a journaling tool but also a social networking tool where people can click through and see uh, online uh, versions of uh, something that you journaled about or an image that you took. Um, just a, a really simple, elegant way and uh, and I've been, since I've started using it uh, probably a month and a half, two months ago, been fairly faithful in uh, in keeping it up to date, at least an entry a day and uh, helps me in my uh, Bible study as well as uh, my prayer life too, so it gives me an opportunity to to write through that, and I, that's kind of kept me on, uh, you know, on the beam, so to speak, uh, with my uh, on my spiritual journey as well. And I've uh, done different kinds of journals before, paper journals, and used one note and whatever. But this one seems to to be sticking, and uh, I like the way they they've done it. I like it that it nags you. I use one day one yep. too. Yeah, you use it too, right, Sally? I do, and it'll remind me if it, I have. And it will. Uh, never every day it will. Mm -hmm. uh, my second uh, kind of related pick, and a pick that uh, or an app that I'm using a lot every day, one of those everyday apps is uh, My Fitness Pal. Uh, ever since my uh, my bout with the heart surgeon. Um, I've really watched my calories and my fitness pal is just one of the best apps at uh, at allowing you to count calories pretty easily because that can be really burdensome to try and uh, you know count those calories every one but they have a huge database and you can uh, even uh, you know when we get a recipe online or whatever Debbie picks a, a recipe online and uh, makes it goodness knows I wouldn't make can't make it um, but she does. Uh, she, she can just send me a link to it, and I can uh, point my fitness pal at it, and it'll, it'll suck it in and uh, do all the ingredients and come up with a calorie count for that dish per serving. So it's uh, it makes it really easy to stay on top of things. Gives you goals uh, for uh, for staying uh, you know fit. If you have a weight loss goal or a weight gain goal, it'll tell you how many calories and what you should be. Uh, Avoiding or adding or saying, "Hey, you're getting close to your sodium, you know, limit or whatever it is, your cholesterol, whatever." Uh, just does a nice job with that, and this works on multiple platforms. I think this is iOS, Android, and um, Windows Phone, as well as a, as a website. So that's my fitness pal. So that was one of my favorites. One that I use probably more than any other app on my phone at this point. After every meal and snack. So. And you know, Martin, I use that as well. I'm not logged in right now on my phone, but I think I am on my iPad. Mm -hmm. um, and if I remember correctly, on my phone, it has a step counter. So I'm not a Fitbit person. It will, um, it will in integrate with or allow you to hook up with those kinds of step oh, counters. Yep. Okay. The so iPhone like 5S, like you have, does do step counting, so it'll measure <laughs> that. Or if you do a Fitbit, yeah, it'll uh, track that as well, and then you get credit for that. So if you uh, if you do exercise, uh, you know, if you walk your 10,000 steps or whatever it is, you'll get calorie credits for that, so you can eat more. So it's important to uh, throw those in there as well. A versatile tool. Yep. Yep. You have one more. I I have two more. Two more. I only <laughs> have one. Squeeze more. them in there. Um, <laughs> the first one is. Um, a uh, Wi-Fi, uh, I don't know what they are. I'm not that great at this. Is it a router? The Unify? Wi-Fi access point? Yeah. Access point, just like it says there on the screen. Um, we heard a lot about Ubiquity's products this year, Martin, in 2014, I mean. And um, so much so that I recommended it to my husband. He checked it out, and we bought one for our home. I know a lot of our uh, well schools are going to Ubiquity products to cover um, 
their needs for Wi-Fi access points, and we have been super happy with the one that we bought and are using in our home. Um, and so much so that my son is really happy to invite all his friends here to play <laughs> intense video gaming online. So it became the, hap the hottest spot um, for a lot of teenage boys. The but, new water cooler. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, you know, we had struggled in the past with, you know, we go upstairs with our devices or whatever, and all of a sudden the Wi-Fi isn't so great. And I can't say that to be the case any longer. We can even still get the Wi-Fi signal out in the garage out there. So um, it's it's a pretty powerful signal, and we've been really pleased with it. And I think we would um, say the same about many who have been on the podcast this year. I know Drew Willems talked about using it at Shoreland and others. I, I think James Karlovsky had mentioned they use it at Kettle Moraine as well. So um, many of the schools are looking at this as an option. Good. All right. One more quick mention before I... Yeah. And this is kind of non techy and just an honorable mention, but I would say that 2014 for me was the year of a Kanban board. Um, and by that, I mean a board, and actually I have a, a an image to share from MLC where we're using Kanban boards in our network services office where we put post-it notes on the board to represent different projects and we work them through when we're thinking about them, talking about doing them, working on them actively or release them. And so we get this visual display of our project list and and I'm doing that with MLC coworkers, with Synod coworkers and even at home. We even have a Kanban board for our family, Martin, and, and that has made a big difference for us. I think it adds a level of accountability. You typically have a short meeting maybe each morning to kind of say what I'm going to be working on for the day and um, and just kind of that sharing so everybody knows what's going on with all the different projects has really made a big difference in my productivity this year. So. Very cool. I hadn't thought of that on the family level, especially yeah. when you've got uh, multiple family members um, all going in different directions. Definitely. Okay. Uh, my last pick is, uh, I referenced it earlier in the show, talking about my favorite episode, The State of Social Media, and that is uh, a ebook, but it's also a blog post here, Five Instagram Ideas for Churches. Uh, there's a whole series of these ebooks on different uh, social media topics, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I picked Instagram because I believe that that is really something that's going to be front and center for a lot of churches and trying to figure out how to use imagery in their ministries and Instagram is the platform, uh, the social media platform for sharing images. They talk about a number of things here in the ebook promoting a sermon series, crowdsource videos which Instagram now accepts, inspiring images with scripture or quotes. You use the, uh, the Canva tool that you talked about, one of your other picks. Uh, youth, Instagram youth ministry games, um, you know, lo lots of different uh, ways to to use uh, Instagram and uh, this whole ebook series. I would highly recommend. Uh, Lauren Hunter was uh, on the show and talked about them and how she co-wrote. And uh, I think it's uh, worth a look if your church is interested in figuring out how to use social media in your ministry plan. Um, these books would be a good place to start. Excellent. What's next, Sally? Are we going well, straight to community feedback? We could certainly do that. We have um, exhausted. You make it sound like questions. I'm skipping something, though. <laughs> um, we do. We did. I guess maybe make quick mention of the fact that there were um, several contests that we ran in 2014. We had some people walk away with some great prizes thanks to the Wells Tech podcast, and we all benefited greatly because the contests were around um, ministry resource ideas, listener reviews. We have a whole page um, with links to all kinds of reviews on different products and software solutions and uh, websites and all kinds of things. And then we did a pastor's text survey where we learned from pastors um, all the different tools that they're using. So through those three um, channels um, throughout the year we learned a lot about um, new tech and ministry ideas and so congrats to the winners we gave away Hemsoft, we gave away a Nexus 7 tablet and an Apple TV during 2014. Very good, yep. So. 
Now community feedback. Definitely. Time to jump to community feedback. All right. Um, first up, we heard from someone you know, Martin, Pastor Dan Witte down at Risen Saver in Lakewood Ranch, Florida. Yep. That's my brother-in-law. What did he and have to say? He had um, a recommendation for those who are interested in MuseScore. MuseScore is um, for... Open source... Uh, Notation software, music yes. notation software. Music notation software, and there is a new um, beta release of MuseScore 2.0 beta 2. So they've already been through one round of beta. They're back with another round of beta, and there's lots of new features. There's a video here that you can watch that they walk through um, many of the new features that are there and tell you about some of the things that changed even since their beta one release. So if you're a MuseScore user or are interested in some music notation um, software, check out this beta release and perhaps it'll do the trick for you. They've got versions for Windows, Mac, um, and it says Linux packages are on their way. Good. Very good. Thanks for sharing um, that. Next up we heard from our friend Perry Lund, who teaches at Evergreen Lutheran High School, and he pointed us to High School Cube dot com, um, and it says that this site is for sharing high school moments live for free. So if you're a high school and you don't have live streaming yet, perhaps this is a solution you can use. Highschoolcube.com. I know um, Minnesota Valley Lutheran High School is also using this now, Perry. Um, Perry mentioned that they started using it with an iPad, streaming from an iPad on a tripod, and that's exactly what MVL is doing. Um, but now he's um, purchased a couple of handy cams. Sony handy cams, and I think you can get these at a fairly reasonable price and get some really um, more professional quality imagery um, into your live stream. So we'll be waiting to hear from you, Perry, about the results of um, some of those enhancements that you're doing to your live streaming. And just another quick shout out to Perry. I read last night that um, he and his wife were at a restaurant and their car was broken into and he lost oh, his no. Mac and iPad, unfortunately. Oh, wow. And, um, you know, I give him all the credit. He says they're working through resetting passwords and security procedures. And I guess it's just kind of a warning to us to always, you know, be aware of our digital commodities and be able to respond if something um, drastic like that were to happen. So... We, yeah, be um, careful, hope. and also, you know, there is definitely software out there that you can install that would give you the ability to remote, remote wipe that, um, so that that data, once they turn it on, is going to be gone. Um, mm -hmm. So that would be, uh, especially if you do any kind of traveling or you you have uh, you run the risk of that. Uh, I know it, airports are notorious for that. Um, mm -hmm. That'd be good things to think about in the new year. Not the first time I've heard of it happening, unfortunately. So, right. Right. Yeah. All right, our Wells Tech Listserv has been a bit busy these days, Martin. We heard from Ryan Rosenthal, who teaches at Faith and Fond du Lac, and Ryan is working on um, a teacher's conference presentation on Web 2.0 collaborative tools. And in an effort to enhance his, um, his presentation he put together, guess what? A Google form. <laughs> and he'd like for you guys to all go out and take his survey. So we'll include a link to that, he says he'll share the results with those that participate, and um, and we can all learn together from this data that he gathers about Web 2.0 collaboration. Great idea, great use. Yeah. Um, also on the list, serve we heard from Leslie Bergerman. Um, she says that her husband Mark is looking for some simple accounting software, um, preferably free, um, and this is in relation to the LutheranScience.org website and nonprofit organization that he's a part of. So um, they're just looking for something simple um, to keep up with some of their accounting functions uh, with that organization. And so if you have any accounting software recommendations for Leslie and Mark Bergerman, then feel free to share them um, perhaps on the Wells Tech list server. If needed, you certainly could email um, wellstech at wells.net and Martin and I will get that email routed to Leslie and Mark as well. So. Great. Um, and then finally from the list serve, just a, a last minute um, entry from Kathy Weigold at Christ in Oakley, Michigan. And Kathy says, my church is looking to change our membership management software. We currently use Microsoft Access, but Office Pro is so expensive that we'd like to move to something with a smaller price tag attached, aka free. Any suggestions? 
And interestingly, Martin, uh, I think we do have a suggestion that, I mean, there's lots yeah, of different ways. If you want ways. to stay with Office product, you can go the free route. Uh, Office uh, 365 for nonprofits we've talked about in the past. Um, you have to kind of live in the, you know, in the cloud, which, you know, may, may suit their needs. I mean, it's essentially the same as choosing um, Google, uh, the Google products, so you're, you are living in the cloud. Um, there is also lower cost options. I believe it's two bucks a month for um, you know the suite for nonprofits if you qualify. So you can investigate that. We'll put a link in the show notes. But there's a, you don't have to give up the quality that you get with um, with the Microsoft products just because of price, especially if you are a a nonprofit. So there's opportunity there to explore that. So uh, you don't have to kind of go a totally different direction. Definitely. All right, I'm going to jump then over to Digo, where a couple of links um, are worth mentioning. First, from Tim Gablehouse, um, the left sider download. He says it allows you to move your Windows controls to the left as he moves between Mac at work and Windows at home. I'm always moving to the wrong side of the window to minimize or close it. This tool will fix that problem. So um, check out left sider. Uh, I'll show a quick screen view of that. If you are mainly a Mac person who wants your Windows to behave a little bit better so that <laughs> <laughs> your brain isn't scrambled, it's a, a free download, it looks like. So right. check it out. Speaking of Digo, Sally, this is a little off topic. I don't know if you've been in Digo lately and, and adding tried to add things to lists. That has changed that whole paradigm has changed to this thing called an outliner. I did see and that. If I'm reading it correctly, um, your current list can be migrated to the outliner, but if you want to create new outliners, that's a premium feature. Oh, wow, and that's something I've made use of a lot. Yeah, I'm not real happy about that. If that's true, I don't know if any of our listeners or viewers have any uh, experience with that. It just happened in December, so I hadn't uh, been there in a couple weeks over the holidays, but I was putting together a list of different links I wanted to take. We were doing a little antique shopping. I did some research and wanted to create some uh, links to different shops we were going to visit. And um, I couldn't actually add it to a list. I had to, uh, actually I gave up and used OneNote, but uh, I wanted to use Digo because that's a great application for it. But they're using this new concept called Outliner. So maybe that is available kind of in that... Uh, in the teacher edition for, for free, but uh, it's de definitely uh, maybe their way of trying to stay afloat and make some money. We'll see how that develops, but I bet there's a lot of people out there looking for new options, so yeah. Yeah, <laughs> we'll <was>. see. <coughs> All right, um, one more from Digo, just a quick link I'll throw in the show notes from me, and it was just something I came across, um, Google's live streaming guide. So it's step by step if you want to live stream using your YouTube account. Um, I should have said Google. I, I meant YouTube, which is part of Google. But specifically with your YouTube account, you can live stream if you are in good standing. And you can turn that on in your account features, and then it walks you through how to make use of that. Yep. <laughs> basically using the same technology we use because Google Hangouts you know, goes up to, to YouTube. <coughs> right. And I'm about to lose my voice. I've got one more. I'm over there. Can one more to go. You can do it. Back to share. It's from our great friend Jason Schmidt, who said, "I don't know what rock I've been living under, but I just found Twitter Analytics." So he tweeted us the link, analytics.twitter.com. And if I can make my screen share work one more time, you can see our analytics for our Wells Tech site. So you can see. Um, how much engagement you've got, how many link clicks you have, and those kind of things. And um, you can actually promote things, you can see your tweets and replies, all kinds of things about engagement and that kind of thing. So looks to be very thorough. I know I've looked at Facebook analytics quite a lot, but I never knew there was Twitter analytics to this extent. So check I it out. I don't know what those numbers mean that you're showing there, Sally, but it looks impressive. A thousand, <laughs> 1.9 K impressions over a 28-day period. That sounds good. It does. <laughs> so, I'll have yeah. to do a little more research. I did not. Maybe I had heard that this was uh, 
that this was out there, but I, I really need to do a little bit more research. And that's really an encouragement, uh, I think, for, for congregations and schools uh, in general is to use the analytics tools that you have, Google Analytics or whatever, just to see how you're doing with your efforts. It's just good stewardship to make sure that uh, all the hard work or even sometimes money that you're putting into an effort is uh, worth it. You want to, to make sure that uh, the strategy is sound, and you can do one of those touch points is to figure out how to uh, see how many people are watching or visiting. And if it's not the numbers you want to see, either stop doing it or do it differently, change your strategy. Very good. All right, we don't have a video this week, but we do yep. have an encouragement that, uh, or do we have a video this week? We do have a video. Well, you came up with it all by yourself? <laughs> Just a surprise. Which you normally do. <laughs> no, I don't. Oh, there it is. It was off the screen. What's our featured video this week? Um, it's actually from our friends at Divine Savior Lutheran Academy, which is down in Durrell, Florida. Durrell, Florida. Quite the yes. school they have going down there. Yeah. Beautiful website, DivineSaviorAcademy.com. And I came across this promotional video for their pre-K program. Excellently done, and I think it would be a good model for anyone who wants to put together a promotional video. This isn't the only one. We'll include a link in their show notes, and you can explore their website. They have a lot of great video stuff going on on their website. So um, use them as a model, and, and maybe 2015 is the year that you'll do some promotional video uh, work for your congregation or school. It's actually easier than you think. Um, before we jump to what's going on next week, just an encouragement if you'd like to contribute to the show like all the good people did this this past week, um, we'd really love you to do that. And uh, it's so easy to do if you go to wellstech.wells.net and leave a comment on uh, one of the shows, uh, one of the show note episodes uh, down there at the bottom. Just click uh, comment and uh, you're good to go. But across the top, there's all of our social networking locations, including Google+, Facebook, Twitter, Digo, Pinterest, of course. Uh, the listserv link is there. You can send us an email, wellstech at wells.net. Or you can communicate with Sally or I directly. We'll kind of make its way, you know, those kind of comments, if you're willing, will make their way to the show, and uh, we'd be happy to share them. So lots of good stuff there. You didn't mention they can send us a voicemail as well, Mark. Yeah, maybe we should to... make that a New Year's resolution, get some voicemails in the system here. Love so. to include their voice on the next Wells Tech episode. Yep, love to do that. Next week, we continue our book discussion, What's Best Next, part Four, if you're following along at home, uh, what is it called? Architect, create a flexible structure. That's the uh, the A after the D. What is it? D-A-R-E. The R -E acronym is DARE. DARE. And last DARE. time we did DEFINE, so this is Architect. Yep. And this one I found, I think I've turned the corner with this book, Sally. Um, it's a little suspicious, and it got a uh, little too, I mean, it he made a point, but he made it too many times, I think, in these chapters. Now, this chapter, or these chapters that we're going to talk about, uh, really resonated with me and kind of actually changed my behavior for the better, I hope. Um, so I think you, uh, you're going to want to tune in next week and listen to us talk about uh, how to architect that uh, daily, how you, how you pick and uh, choose what goes on during your day and how you might structure that. So tune in next week for that. Good discussion. Looking forward to it. Are we out of ammunition here, Sally? I'm out of voice, so we better stop. Okay. Thanks, everybody, for joining us in the new year. We look forward to uh, uh, hopefully one that uh, God will bless for us here on the Wells Tech Podcast. Uh, see you next week. Bye-bye.